So welcome. This is the Art of Herding Cats Leading Teams of Leaders Leadership Stars program. And today I have a very, very dear friend, um, uh, Rolanda Wilson, who's going to join us. And I'll tell you just a little bit about her in just a minute. But I wanted to remind you that this program is designed for reluctant leaders and leaders who are just getting on their journey to leadership. It's a time when I bring together for you individuals who are in various leadership roles and have some really fabulous experiences to share with you about one, having stepped into that leadership, and two, what it's taken to really hone their craft as a leader. Now, you may not be at the top of your um, network marketing company, you may not be a top leader in your corporate job, and you may just be starting, but this is the perfect place for you. Um, we've, we've talked to individuals in the writing and publishing arena. We had a fabulous woman on who talked about your voice and how it really brings your leadership to life. Um, we've had individuals talk about journaling and how important it is to get your story out. So listen to some of these programs. I think you'll find that they have some interesting tidbits of information for you as a leader that will really make you even more powerful than you are today. So today let's talk about Rolanda Wilson. Um, Rolanda has given me her fabulous biography. And I'm going to let her tell you a little bit about her. But there's one thing that I really wanted to highlight is that in August of last year, she was in, installed as the president of the Women's Council of the National Association of Real Estate Brokers. And because of that, she's launched a program that I think is just absolutely stellar. And that's the Fundamental Investments in Real Estate Management, or what they call FIRM. And it's a mentorship program that targets low to moderate income high school teenagers uh, basically ages 16 through 18, to increase their awareness of the importance of understanding finances. But I can tell you, as a business owner and relatively successful at what I do and having a degree in economics, that boy, when I was 16 to 18, I sure could have used somebody to instruct me and to mentor me in the world of finance, because it can certainly get away from you. So I, I really applaud um, Rolanda for stepping into that as a leader and taking that on as a challenge, um, hopefully to um, take it across the country. Yes? Yes. Yeah. That's so Rolanda, go ahead. I said, that's our plan. Good. All right. So Rolanda, tell, tell us all a little bit about you and how you got to where you are today. Well, Linda, actually, believe it or not, I know, I know you just mentioned about being installed as president of a real estate association, yeah. um, but my original passion was finance. So my degree is in finance, and I thought, you know, that's all I would ever do in life. But, you know, as life comes on and changes happen and um, I hit one of the, bu the bubble bursts. Then I found myself in real estate and I found that I have another passion in real estate. Mm -hmm. And working with first time home buyers, and because I have the background in real estate, it was kind of easy for me to adapt the numbers and understanding how much a buyer will qualify for. Um, I came into contact with a lot of people who did not qualify and they didn't qualify it's because they really didn't learn the basic things that some of us kind of take for granted. Mm -hmm. So as I've been taking the time to help and to mentor them and coach them to understand their finances, how the how to um, increase their credit scores, you know, how to do their savings, how to pay down, you know, I've kind of come up with a whole new passion. Um, and then that's why I kind of love the, the firm, the fundamental in real estate management is that we've got an opportunity to to reach kids at that pivotal age, 16 to 18 years old. We do target inner city kids um, who probably don't have the foundation that some of us had. And we give them those financial literacy skills, how to dress for success, how to work in a, in a work environment to get them ready, not only for college, but get them ready for life. Oh, that sounds so wonderful. And Thanks. definitely something that, I, to be honest with you, I think all teenagers need to know. Um, even those that are in affluent neighborhoods don't always learn a lot about finance because mom and dad always take care of it and it just seems to sort of flow through, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so you have a, a degree in finance, mm -hmm. you're a real estate broker, 
Mm -hmm. um, how did you become, and, and you work there with um, individuals who are buying homes and that kind of thing, helping them to understand their finances. How did you move from that to being a small business coach? Well, again, my background was, was in finance. So mm -hmm. all of the, the tools that I use in my program, Five Steps to Your Financial Success for Small Business Owners, I've actually utilized in my business. I think I want to say that I became a small business owner when I was in college, when I when I opened my own tax practice. Um, so I'm using all of these skills that I've gained across, you know, throughout the years. I've mm -hmm. also, I was also a a um, finance coach for um, mothers of parents of the inner city kids to kind of increase the poverty level. So I've kind of taken all of my experiences, the real estate, the finance, and put them all together and put them into a package that is just specific towards small business owners. Understanding the key drivers that I've that each business owner needs to know in order to make their profits grow. And I'm just using, again, the techniques from my finance businesses from corporate America and applying them to the small business owner. So Rolanda, do you have a particular type of business owner that you really like to work with and you get huge successes with? You know what? I really love a business owner who has been in business for at least three to five years. Mm -hmm. And I say that because you have to have some experience, some knowledge of your revenue that you're generating or why you are not generating it or some of the expenses. So let's say if you were a jewelry maker, you want to know what it takes to make a piece of jewelry. You've got to have that experience and you've tried to sell it. And then part of the program is that you were understanding the revenue and the expenses to help make those profits grow. So you, so the people that I work with are have been in business at least three to five years and have had some experience with the revenue, with their expenses, and they're really at that point where they need to understand their numbers because they're ready to take their business to the next level. Right. So do you help them also with pricing and, and that kind of thing to make sure that what they're charging will cover their expenses and give them some um, proceeds? Yes. So exactly. That's actually in step four of the program. Ooh. And it's where will I find the time? Well, you'll find the time is because we need to analyze your revenue funnel, your expense funnel, and determine whether or not your price points are, are too high or too low. Um, mm -hmm. Are you really spending the money that you need to spend? We, we actually even take a look at how you're spending your money. Kind of some of the basic things that we would even look at on if we were looking at um, personal coaching as well. Okay, so Rolanda, when, when you're coaching a small business owner, oftentimes they're an entrepreneur or they're sole, sole practitioner. Do you look at their personal um, finances as well since oftentimes they're proceeds, their profitability is going towards not only, you know, uh, rent and, and that kind of thing, but it's also going to pay their, their personal bills. So do you look at both? Right now we're only, we only look at the, the business because it's a matter of making the business grow. Now, if we do need to take a step back, if for example, we've had someone who's um, funding for the small business is actually coming from the personal business and right. we need take a look at that, then we, we will take those necessary steps to take a step back, look at the personal and bring it in. It depends on where they are. But the goal is starting with business owners who have been in business for three years, we've established some type of revenue stream. And right. our, our goal is to take that business to the next level. Okay. So what are the, the key indicators, the, the key numbers that a business owner should be looking at when, when they see their financial statements every month? So revenue, expenses and net income. Those are the three numbers that they need to look at every single month. Okay. So th those are pretty basic numbers um, mm -hmm. to be looking at. Um, and what are some of the things that, that they really need to review? I mean, I mean, I know you can look at the percentages and the, the various ratios and that kind of thing, but that gets pretty complicated. So for somebody just starting out, what do I want to know about revenue versus expenses versus profitability? Well, if you if actually if you're just starting out, you really want to understand um, your business. You need to understand your client. You need to understand the potential for revenue growth and what 
and how much money is it going to take to get the revenue that you need so there's going to be some homework in the forefront and mm -hmm. one of the things when we always start out is that you got to have a budget every business needs to have a budget and that's where you need to start out and that homework leads to build that budget so if i know in year one or in year two, I want to make X amount of money, then what is the expenses associated based on your current knowledge of that? What, how, how much is going to take to generate that income? And in that you're flowing in your marketing expenses, your networking expenses, which is important because we know that that can always get out of, out of control. Oh, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> Especially so when it's costing you $52 a month, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So we want to start out there. And that's the first place that every business owner should start. Understanding um, the business that you are hoping to acquire and then budgeting for that. And then as you go through year one, year two, and year three, you can always compare back to that budget to see where you're off. But, you know, I also want to, want to even once you're past year, past, past year three and four, you should still be looking at your budget because you need to revise that budget every single year, right? Absolutely. Okay, exactly. And, and not only that, but you know, if you're looking at your vision, your five-year vision of where you think the company is going to be, where you're going to be, um, and you know, part of that is obviously the numbers that you're looking at, not just you know, gee, I want to live in Nordock, Scotland, but how am I going to survive there? You know, exactly. where's the money going to come from to be able to go down to the butcher and 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 get the meat for that particular day and that kind of thing. So I, I can see where understanding those numbers and having a really clear budget of what's it going to take to get there um, mm -hmm. and, and make my vision happen. Yeah. And um, funny you, you mentioned doorknob because one of the things that we want, to, that my goal for my clients is that not only are they living the life that they desire, but they're also generating the money that they desire. And of course, everyone needs to save on a personal level, on a business level, and taking those profits and reinvesting them to the, into um, passive income. So while you're going to the butcher and door knock, you still have that money coming in, right? <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, that's that's the cool thing about you know my my target market, which are direct marketers, is the fact that. They, they all are looking for that passive income, those residual incomes from the folks who are, you know, they're, they're wholesale purchasers as well as those that are building a team. So yeah, it's really important to understand. So who's out there? Who's my foundation? Who's that 80% that are just product buyers and what's going on with the other 20%? Exactly. And how do I, and as you know, how do I retain them so that I can count on that residual income coming in? Mm -hmm. um, and not have those roller coaster rides each month, right? Yes. And the roller yeah. coasters will come, but they're planned for. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh -huh. I mean, you, you expect that there'll be a certain drop off, and yes. what you, at least in the indirect marketing, what you're helping is that the drop off is dropping into still a wholesale product buyer, um, not dropping out entirely and being suspended from your, your records. Exactly. Uh, that's, that's sort of the worst thing that can happen That's, to you. It's the worst thing. But, you know, of course, in some, in some businesses, there's seasonalities. Oh, yeah. We, we want to plan for those seasonalities. So we're not in, you know, in a negative net income cash flow. Um, we can actually be positive because we've actually, you know, planned for those things throughout the year. So, in other words, you set your budget at the beginning of the year knowing that probably 75% of your income comes in in the October through December timeframe, mm -hmm. if you're you're in that kind of a business, mm -hmm. um, and then you have all the sales in January and February, and you know how is that? And then you're right; it could at that point sort of trail off, especially during the summer months, yes. right? Yes. Yeah. Or if you live in Hawaii, you know it's the summer months, so you have huge numbers of people coming in in the summer. You may drop off in September and October, but then right. the holidays come through. Uh, okay, I'll tell you a story. Um, my husband and I went over years and years and years ago to Hawaii and it was around the Christmas holidays mm -hmm. and God, we had such a great time. You know, it was, it was between Christmas and New Year's and we, you know, just rocking and having a great time going down to the disco. That'll tell you how long it goes. Um, and then, you know, we got through New Year's Eve and New Year's Eve was just absolutely really powerful because you know how much they love fireworks. Mm -hmm. But January 1, we went to the disco and they were playing Lawrence Welk music because all of the hip people 
had gone home. And the only ones left were the retired who were going to spend Christmas there. Or it was, been there. It, was just, it was so funny. It was such a dramatic change in their business from one yeah. day to the next. It was just impressive. Yes. Yeah. 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 And I, and and one of the things that that um, we do in the program, especially with understanding the revenue, um, mm -hmm. and I don't know, I might I might have shared this story with you before, but you know, one of my clients is a jewelry maker, and typically those are the my stories that I share is because her story was so fascinating. You know, she handmade all of her jewelry. Um, wow. And her expenses came with traveling to Michael's and to the jewelry shows. But she also, you know, took out vendor booths at various shows. Um, she did home shows. She would travel up and down the state doing mm -hmm. home shows because, you know, her business was just that large. And when right. we sat down and took a look at her, at her, at her, where her revenue was coming from, she actually made more money in the home shows than she did at the vendor booths. And you would have thought she would have, you know, more exposure at the vendor booths, but the cost of the booth and for the amount of sales that she had at there, you know, it, it really wasn't as profitable. So we were able to refocus back mm -hmm. to um, home shows and she was able to redo her marketing just to target that target market. So actually worked out for her. So that's just an example of one of the things that we kind of do when we're looking at the revenue models and the expense models. Yeah, and Roland, I think that's so really critical is the fact that you, know, you think you're going to get a lot of exposure at a trade show. And I know some of the things I've found is that people are almost have blinders on as they're walking down the aisle and they don't even look left to right to figure out who's there. They're fo so focused on going in one place or wherever they, in, you know, wherever they're um, goal is that they never even see you um, yes. and much less look at your products or, or, or whatever. And you can stand there and, you know, hawk out there trying to, you know, get them to come into your booth and they're just, no, I'm going there. And I, I think you're right. You may have hundreds and thousands of people at the trade show, but they're not necessarily coming to see you. And vendor bill fees are getting very expensive. I've had one client, they paid upwards to $800 for a one day wow. event. Mm -hmm. And how many people did they guarantee were gonna be there? They thought maybe a thousand, but you know, she said that it definitely was not a thousand people there. But $800 yeah. is a lot. Yeah, uh, and it, it's it's really sad when you, you stand at your booth and literally you could shoot a, 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 a cannon through <laughs> exactly. the hall and not hit a soul. <laughs> <laughs> they definitely didn't, um, live up to their expectations. Uh -huh. So, yeah. Um, so, okay, we're, we're halfway through the year. This is a great time to be looking at, you know, where am I against my budget? Um, what do I still want to accomplish towards the end of the year? So is this a time when you do um, sort of mid-year correction? And what kinds of numbers do you look at to make that correction? Yes. So we actually look at the prior year so for mm -hmm. we're in 2016, so we've actually looked at the trend for 2015. And then okay. we would look at the first six months of the year. We compare the first six months to last year and kind of project out forecast how we would be okay. how we would look for the for the remainder of the year. Depending on where we are, let's say I'm, I'm having a, you know, my client's having a great year. You know, the first six months is 150% over last year. You know, we're just rocking it, right? And even at this month period, as we're forecasting out through the through the rest of the year, we're forecasting out revenue, expenses, um, and the net cash flow. Then I'll even have them go back to their CPA and have them do a mid-year projection as well. Because of course we don't want them at the end of the year to hit a huge tax liability because we've generated all this income that we probably didn't do our estimated taxes on for, you know, because it was based on 2015. So not right. only do you look at your business revenue expenses, um, and we're drilling down to all the various line items as well, we're projecting out for 2016. We're also looking at 2015, the first six months of 2016 to see if there's something that we could have done better. Maybe we need to make some tweaks. Yeah, maybe we need to do more marketing. Maybe we need to do less marketing. Maybe you need to shift where you're marketing. And then 
we figure out where we're going to be at the end of the year. But it's crucial, it's crucial for every small business owner to understand the tax implications of the revenue as well that you're generating because it will affect you come April 15th or April or March, depending on you know, your your filing status or your entity. <laughs> or, or October 15th if you do an extension. Yes, or October 15th yeah. if you do an extension. <laughs> the penalty still assess, assesses, so you know, might as well right. get it done. So Rolanda, is there one number that you rely on um, to tell the individual like how they're doing and whether they're on track or, or whatever? You know what, at the end of the day, what is your net income? That is the telltale number. But you can't just rely on that number because it encompasses so much. We really need to drill down on the various levels or the various, sometimes I, for revenue, I'll call them lines of business. You know, where is mm -hmm. it coming in? How much does it take to make that dollar? Right. Okay, there, the, that which caused just a, a quick flash that went in and out of my brain. Um, Hmm. Okay, um, let me ask you a question about investments. So um, how do you advise your client as far as investments? Like, um, does it make more sense to rent? Does it make more sense to buy? Um, especially if you're a business owner, how, how do you advise them as far as those kinds of decisions are concerned? So are you, when you say rent, rent or buy, are you talking about um, commercial space? Uh, commercial space. Commercial yeah. space. Really, it, it really it depends on the business, the income that's mm -hmm. generated, and your location. So some areas in our Bay Area here, it might be more beneficial to purchase than it would be to rent because our rents are astronomical. So yeah. it really, it, it's a combination of factors before we can just, it's just not a flat out, you should buy or you should rent. I think okay. it's a case by case basis. Do you advise people um, because of the, I mean, I, I know how high the cost is for renting space because I'm in rental space. Um, how about home offices versus commercial space? Home offices have their benefits as well. And I always have to preface that you need to speak with your CPA or, or tax preparer when you're deciding to make yeah. these choices. But there are benefits using an old, a home office because you can have some write-offs on your taxes for the home office. So there, there is an advantage there, but you have to look long-term past that because you know, you're gonna reap the benefits of it you know, this year, but what happens when you sell it? What are you doing to your basis in your property when you sell it? So those, those are some right. things that you need to consider. And again, that's going to be a case by case basis. Okay. So Rolanda, um, as we're beginning to wrap up, um, I know that you have at least one fabulous tip to give a business owner. And what would that be? Wow. It would be to put budget you have to budget you have to understand where you're where you're going um mm -hmm. you can't increase your profits if you don't know where you're going or where your where your money is coming from so a budget and forecasting i think is critical for every business owner okay all right and for those of us who hate to budget uh, <laughs> and you know give me a call give me a call and then i will be more than happy to work with you on that Oh, I know, I know. And somewhere in my life, I, I, it, it's funny, as a kid, I budgeted. Um, I had to. My mom gave me one of those little um, sort of fold out um, files. Uh -huh. and she, labeled, she labeled each tab, you know, things like clothes and candy and savings and church. And, that, and you know, she'd give me my allowance, and I had to put pennies, nickels, dimes, Idiot. quarters into those. Um, folders and you know when it reached a certain amount that I you know was like do you want to spend it or do you want to continue to save it um, and that kind of thing so I learned a little bit about you know budgeting there um, it's and not I my do favorite it every month. I do it every single month do I don't really? know it, it must be a habit oh yeah 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 um, I do have one other question for you what do you do about cash flow um, I mean your business and my business and I know my husband's businesses um, you know, you bill a, a certain amount um, at the beginning of the month, 
And then it's a question of when your clients decide to pay you um, yes. and whether they're aging your bills. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of thing. How do you plan for um, really weird swings in cash flow? Well, again, when we're looking at the prior year and you've been in business for a while, which I know that you and your husband have been, you'll be able to see um, a cycle. And you then think so. You will. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, I you know I can't. You know, looking back at last year, I can't say that even the same clients are going to have the same challenges mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. when they decide to pay our bills. Mm -hmm. But as you're getting new as you're getting new clients and you are um, reviewing your budget at least on a quarterly basis, then right. you know yeah. you would have to tweak the budget accordingly. Um, but even so, even when you're creating the budget, you know that there are some delays in payments or there are some agings. So you would factor those in up front. And okay. understand. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah. And then also, <laughs> also, you, also you, you, you need someone to come in and, and make sure they're making those phone calls to get your money in as, as soon as possible. Yeah, when you have a husband who's an attorney who, who's adverse to calling his clients and saying, hey, when are you going to pay me? Um, it becomes an interesting challenge. Anyway, um, Rolanda, I know that you have a fabulous free offer for those those individuals who are listening to this broadcast. And I'd love for you to share just a little bit about what it is. And I know it's got a tremendously long URL um, right now. But if you could share with them what it is, and you know, we'll, we'll put the URL up on um, the website and in the description of the program, so that people can get it directly. Okay, sounds good. So, um, this is actually one of um, our steps, and it's in step one of five steps to your financial freedom. And in step one, it's like, how do I get? Step one is how did I get here? And it's understanding how you've spent your money, but it also mm -hmm is a reflection about your relationship with money. So it's an exercise, it's one that we actually do in class in, in step one. And um, I'm giving it free to all of your viewers that you know sometimes just when you have a few moments, sit back, read through it, um, work, out the, work out the exercises. And it's, it's pretty simple and straightforward, right? Mm -hmm. So you work through the exercise and basically it's to give you some insight on how you feel in your relationship with money and it could help you understand how you're spending your money it could help you on a personal level and it can also help you in your business so when you're out shopping and you find that you know for me that new pair of shoes you know what <laughs> one of the emotions which one of the and i kind of you know went through that this past weekend what kind of emotions are you going through and it could help mm. you step back and say hmm where am i now you know is this a need or is this a want or what am I reacting to? So I think it's a great exercise. You know, my clients seem to enjoy it or not enjoy it, I should say. I not enjoy it the case, maybe, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I understand. My, my car's been broken into for the fourth time um, since we've lived here. And it's like, okay, it's time. We have to get rid of my 22-year-old car and get something that has Yes. an alarm system and electronic locks so that perhaps they won't break in as easily. Yes. Um, this time they just stole the garage door opener and I have no idea why, but um, I know they couldn't. St anyways, it's neither here nor there, but um, it's an interesting thing to, to look at and say, so what's, what's holding you back from getting that new car? Um, exactly. you, you know, anyways, it, it, it's an interesting relationship with money and I'm glad you're going to start our listeners off with that look at uh, money. Okay. Yes, and, and, I, and I hope you enjoy it. Yes. I'm I sorry? Say I hope you enjoy it. I hope oh, it gives sure you clarity will. and insight. Yeah, absolutely. And for those of you who would like to step in, step up and step out and own your leadership, um, oftentimes discovering where you are now in in your journey to owning your leadership can be very important. And so um, I'm offering to you my free gift, which is um, the assessment that will help you understand that you probably are a leader and have been for a very, very long time. So again, the URL is on the description of the program and on the website. So take a look at that. Um, and you'll get not only the assessment, but you also get the first um, step in the first, excuse me, get the first lesson in the first step 
of defining leadership. So you get a chance to see what is a leader and who might that look like. Um, and it's a great way to get started and to begin your journey from there. So with that in mind, I'd like to thank you, Rolanda, so very much for being with us today. It's been a joyous journey into finance. Um, and uh, again, thank you so very, very much for being thank here. You so much for having me. Oh, you're so welcome. And for those of you that are listening, um, Leadership Stars comes up about once a month, usually the second Tuesday of the month. So take a look, and we look forward to seeing you next time. And in the meantime, be courageous and dare to lead. <laughs>